Hi guys, how are you going? Campbell here from Autodidactic Channel. Hope you're all having a fabulous day. And today I thought we would have a bit of a look at uh, the, the Phoenicians and who they are, where they came from, and uh, how they've sort of infiltrated uh, our society, but most notably our law and our language. So let's jump into this. <music> This is Encyclopedia Britannica. In the Bible, the Hebrew people, who, after the death of Moses, took possession of the promised land of Canaan under the leadership of Joshua, because the tribes were named after grandsons or sons of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel after he wrestled an angel of the Lord. The Hebrew people became known as the Israelites. Uh, Jacob's wife, Leah, bore him six sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Isaac, and Zebelon. Each was the father of a tribe, though Levi's descendants, among whom were Moses and Aaron, uh, the priests and temple functionaries were dispersed amongst other tribes and received no tribal lands of their own. Two other tribes, Gad and Asher, were named after the sons born to Jacob, uh, then we have Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, two additional tribes, Dan and Naphtali, were named after the sons of Jacob, born in Bilhah, the maidservant of Rachel, Jacob's second wife. And so this is sort of what I want to have a look at here, is one of the twelve tribes of Israel was the tribe of Dan. So let's have a bit of a look-see at the tribe of Dan. One of the twelve tribes of Israel that in biblical times comprised the people of Israel, who later became the Jewish people, the tribe was named after the first two sons of Jacob, also called Israel. After the death of Moses, the Israelites were led into the Promised Land by Joshua, who divided their territory among 12 tribes, the portion assigned the tribe of Dan was a region of west, oh, sorry, a region west of Jerusalem. At least part of the tribe later moved to the extreme northeast and took the city of Laish, renaming it Dan. As the northernmost Israelite city, it became the point of reference in the familiar phrase from Dan to Beersheba. I've never heard that before. Um, the great hero of the Danites was Samson, who, until his betrayal by Delilah, used his mighty strength against the Philistine invaders. Dan was one of the, the ten northern tribes that disappeared from history after the Assyrian conquest of the Kingdom of Israel in 721 BC. They are known in Jewish legends as the ten lost tribes of Israel. So the Assyrian siege of Jerusalem was in approximately 701 BCE uh, by standard chronology and it says Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked the fortified cities of the kingdom of Judah in a campaign of subjugation. Uh, Sennacherib besieged Jerusalem but failed to capture it. It is the only city mentioned as being besieged on Senna <laughs> Sennacherib's Stella, in which, the catch, in which the capture is not mentioned. That's interesting. So basically in, seven, uh, 70, <laughs> basically in 721 BCE, the Assyrian army captured the Israelite capital of Samaria, interesting name, and carried away the citizens of the northern uh, kingdom of Israel into captivity. So we're talking the north here. So uh, the 12 t tribes we're looking at uh, basically the Middle East, no pigs down here, nice tunnel, uh, the Middle East, and then some of them, including the tribe of Dan, went north. They were then uh, taken over by the Assyrians, and then they became the Lost Tribes. 
So who are uh, the tribe of Dan and who did they become? So we had these 12 tribes of Israel, uh, some went north, then they got taken over apparently by the Syri Assyrians and wiped out is the story, and they became the 10 lost tribes. Uh, but is that really the story? And what happened? Were they, were they completely wiped out or were they taken over? So the tribe of Dan were one of the 12 or 13, depending on how you count, tribes of Israel. Their banner displayed the symbol of a serpent, and they were a seafaring tribe as adept and as adventurous as the Phoenicians, and have often been accused as being part of what are referred to as the Sea Peoples. It has, alleged, uh, it has been alleged by the British Israelism Movement, internet movie Ring of Power, Britam organization in Israel and others that Dan left their mark wherever they went. Their mark. Mark of the beast, maybe. Wherever they went, resulting in place names from Denmark, 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 to Britain, and in the names of the four major rivers flowing into the Black Sea, the Danube, the Dnestia, the Dnieper, and the Don. All rivers, all water, tribe of Dan. Now they mention Denmark, uh, who of course are the Dutch. And we have things like the uh, East India Trading Company, which of course was sailing around and again rebranding, uh, remarking every uh, sort of place they came to, including the buildings, I would say, because. Uh, these guys, you know, are they are they the, the Phoenicians? This is the question because these they kind of say you know as adventurous as the Phoenicians. But did the Phoenicians just basically become the take over the tribe of Dan and become them and become uh, you know what is known as the false Jewish people? Um, to appreciate this alleged connection, one has to consider that in ancient Hebrew vows. Sorry, that in ancient Hebrew, vowels were absent. Hence, names containing Din, Den, Dun, or Don, such as Scandon, as in Scandinavia, or Scandon, Scandonia, may be attributed to Dan. And other examples might include Macedonia, Edinburgh, Dunkirk, Aberdeen, Donegal, London, and the list goes on. So there you go. So what they're saying is, is, as far as the language, there were no vowels. So all these things like London could actually have originated as London, Edinburgh, Dankirk. So again, branding all over the place with this name Dan in it, the tribe of Dan. So are they really lost or are they just hiding and lurking in the shadows? The Dutch East India Company, uh, by name of United East India Company, Dutch Verenige, <laughs> Verenige East Indisch Company, trading company founded in the Dutch Republic uh, or the present day Netherlands in 1602 to protect the state's trade in the Indian Ocean and to assist in the Dutch War of Independence from Spain, the company prospered through most of the 17th century as the instrument of the powerful Dutch commercial empire in the East Indies, which is present-day Indonesia. It was dissolved, apparently, in 1799. Uh, of course, Dutch East India Company had a lot to do with India, and uh, going in there and, you know, destroying the culture that was there and inserting their own over the top. Again, you know, the whole rebranding, re remarking um, of their, you know, their face ads, the, the tribe of Dan, the Phoenicians, maybe. You know, I think this, you know, I think that this is the same group of people. The Dutch government granted the company a trade monopoly in the waters between the Cape of, Cape of Good Hope at the southern tip of Africa and the Straits of Magellan between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, with the right to conclude treaties with native princes, build forts and maintain armed forces, and to carry on administrative functions through 
officials who were required to take an oath of loyalty to the Dutch government under the administration of forceful governors, uh, governor generals, most notably Jan Peters, uh, Petersoon Cohen and Anthony Van Diemen, which is where we get the name Van Diemen's Land, which is Tasmania in Australia. Uh, the company was able to defeat the British fleet and largely displace the Portuguese in the East Indies. So basically these guys were given uh, just, you know, the right under, you know, the Dutch government to do whatever they wanted. And, and these guys were supposed to be a trading company, but look, you know, they were given rights to go around, uh, you know, they say to make treaties with the natives, but we know how that all ends, and to build forts and all this kind of stuff, build forts, maintain armed forces... You know, what's that got to do with trade? That sounds a lot more like, um, what do we call <laughs> You know, a lot, lot more like the Mafia. It's, you know, standover tactics. In 1619, the company renamed Jakarta Batavia, now Jakarta, and used it as a base to conquer Java and the Outer Islands. So these guys were about conquering lands. They weren't about trade. By the 17th century, the company had declined as a trading and sea power and become more and more involved in the affairs of Java. By the 18th century, the company had changed from a commercial shipping enterprise to a loose territorial organisation interested in agricultural produce of the Indonesian archipelago. Toward the end of the 18th century, the company became corrupt and seriously in debt. The Dutch government eventually revoked the company's charter and in 1799 took over its debts and possessions and of course uh, linked up with uh, the Dutch we of course have the Dutch royal family and if you don't know a lot about them uh, look into them they are one of the uh, big behind the scenes people that we don't really hear a lot about and they recognize as branding in today's world and this something to notice uh, about the you know about branding and the way that it's done is it's very similar to hieroglyphics in that we can look at a symbol uh, say something like this and that's just a, a, a simple symbol but it holds a lot of information you know if you've got uh, the information you need then you can explain what that symbol means over several sentences you know there's quite a bit of information encoded in that same with this same with this same with all these symbols okay so so this is the way that, that we can that we're reading things symbolically and this is really how our brain and our mind works the best we work on images imagination uh, which is right brain rather than left brain which is another thing that's happened is we've been converted over and and educated into using our left brain a lot more than our right brain and we're told we all know in school little kids are told to stop daydreaming and to sit up and pay attention so basically don't use your imagination and this is branding and then so they're going around and they're adding facades the word comes from the french foreign loan word facade which in turn comes from the italian Fasciata, from fascia meaning face, ultimately from post-classical Latin fascia, the earliest usage recorded by the Oxford English Dictionary in 1656. So a facade is literally adding another face. And, and here we get more links with, uh, with words and etymology and how it's all put together. Uh, face, you know, adding a face. If you're adding a new face to a building, what you're doing is covering up the, the face behind it or covering up what's behind it. That makes me think of things like masks and masquerade balls, where people literally cover who they are really and they, and they pretend to be, uh, you know, the facade. Which is very, you know, this is, this is how our society is working. It's a very sort of uh, iconic concept, shall we say. So the tribe of Dan uh, sailed around the world renaming everything in their image. 
rebranding, uh, refacing everything. And we have structures like this, old world structures that are attributed to the Phoenicians, uh, which I believe became the tribe of Dan, either one way or the other, uh, probably more to hide in the background, because the Phoenicians as well, these are the guys who introduced uh, everything pretty much. Uh, so law, the education system, uh, universities, language, basically everything that gives us our perception of reality today was introduced by the Phoenicians because it's all got to do with uh, programming, really. It's, you know, programming us to think they run the education system, the law, you know, they program us what to, to believe what is ethically good and, and right through the law. And, of course, language. And uh, we have many, many words. Of course, we've got, you know, the, the birth canal, birth, the birth waters, breaking the waters, all these things to do with birth and the straw man. Uh, this is all Phoenician maritime law, how they they steal the live or they try and steal the, the live person and replace it with a fictitious paper person who is... Uh, yeah, a straw man who only exists on paper. And this is how they are running the law system. This is how they've taken over everything by sailing around and just, um, yeah. It's like they were, they'll find, you know, after the flood, maybe they'll, you know, here's a map. They were sailing around and finding all the little outposts that were left and, um, basically scamming them, taking them over, you know, pretending to, that they were going in to do trade or whatever to help them and then just, yeah, killing them all, taking over, leaving their forts and armies there and rebranding everything. And uh, here we are today. So there we go, a bit on the Phoenicians and uh, how they are most probably the tribe of Dan. And of course, uh, Phoenicia goes back to all these uh, stories of gods as well. And there is a strong connection to the Archons through that. Uh, which is something I will get into in later videos. Here's an interesting pic just popped up. Uh, just relating to some of the stuff going around about castles and melted buildings lately. Look at all these window type things. All right, so uh, yeah, that's it. I just wanted to finish off with a few words uh, to show you how they have the Phoenicians. Uh, the phonetic alphabet is what we use. Of course, phonetic words are words that sound the uh, that are spelt the way they that they sound. Except phonetic is not a phonetic word, and it's because it's Phoenician. So here's a few more words of how they creep into our life uh, without us knowing. And I wanted to add a bit more about uh, admiralty law and maritime, and specifically uh, words and wordplay and obfuscation, uh, which is basically blinding us with BS. Uh, so we've got here, I'm on the site, this is Mazistic, I'll leave the link below. Uh, have you noticed how many maritime words are commonly used today? Maritime words relate to nautical, sea, ocean, shipping and navigation. The term nautical originates from the Greek word Naughty or nauticos and nautic and middle French nautique from Latin nauticus meaning ship or sailor. Uh, so when you, you probably all know this, when you place your home on real estate market, you are putting it up for sale. Well, that's a good one. Sorry, I was looking ahead of the birth certificate. Uh, yeah, so you put it up for sale or sale. And this is the thing with wordplay and uh, phonetics, which of course is Phoenician. And I used to always wonder when I was young why phonetic was not spelt phonetically. And now I know why. Uh, but the, yeah, so with uh, the phonetic, it, it's more to do, well, it's everything to do with the vibration, which is the sound we make when we say the word not the spelling. The spelling is the spell. That's the trick. That's the sound of the word. So sail and sail are the, are the same word. And they do this with opposites as well. You have the word whole. H-O-L-E, the absence of anything. W-H-O-L-E, everything. 
the exact opposites. And uh, it's been done with a few words, the exact opposite thing. Let's keep going. When we are born, we are issued with a birth or birth certificate at the and the doc, doc, doctor, signs your birth birth certificate as well as your death certificate. Uh, birth is a nautical term. And it comes down here and money is water. So where do you find a bank? On both sides of, of a river. Uh, so river banks control the current or the current sea, the current sea or the flow of money. If you are losing your house, they say your home is underwater or you go into liquidation. When you have a lot of debts, they say you are drowning in debt. If you get into trouble and go to jail, someone has to bail you out, get rid of the water. Okay, the verb bail also means to scoop water out of a boat. We say to someone, money goes through your hands like water. Many ter terms have the word ship. And this is what I found pretty interesting. Look at this. Ownership, citizenship, leadership, rulership, lordship, relationship, partnership, scholarship, apprenticeship, dealership. And it goes on. So all these words, ship, it's all been put in our language and... This is what I think the, con the confoundment of language at the Tower of Babel is all about. I don't believe that it was everyone, you know, walking around speaking English and they were suddenly made to be speaking, you know, some were French, some were German, some were Spanish, etc. I think what it was telling us is that uh, it was the obfuscation of the language. So they basically changed the language. Uh, and change the meaning of the word so that no one could understand what they were saying. And so to the rulers, those who wished to rule over us, we, they then said that we were speaking Babel. And of course, Tower of Babel, Babylon, confoundment of languages. Uh, and this goes on as well. So I'll leave this link for you. And I just wanted to uh, yeah give a shout out to a plain truth and this is the video I was watching uh, where he's talking it's a very good video I recommend you have a look I'll leave the link to this below as well uh, Admiralty Law and the Holy See that this video is called Words of Swords uh, from a plain truth so go and check it out and a plain truth has also been doing some good Tartarian videos so here we've got great Tartarian exhibitions and I've watched a couple of these, so he's quite good. Um, you know, dead Phoenicians, deceptive, you know, a bit on language and Phoenicians. Um, he's got a lot of stuff on current events as well. But as we come down here, he did do. Down here, we've got uh, 1914, Magnificent Tartaria, Elegant Tartaria, Proof of Mud Floods. So quite a few uh, Tartarian, you know, sort of mud flood videos there and he does have one that's interesting as well where he goes through uh, this one did they terminate the tartarians oh no that's not it where he goes through yeah how they may have sort of events that may have actually wiped out the tartarians so it is uh, a plain truth five uh, i think a plain truth has actually lost <laughs> a couple of channels over time and this is looks like it's his fifth attempt so go and give him a subscribe, a like, a comment, and all that good stuff. So there you go, a bit on uh, the tribe of Dan, Phoenicians, maritime law, and uh, the words we use, uh, spelling, and how they may be spells, uh, all down there, you know, because we are speaking languages, and we really, uh, there's, there's all these words in there that, we don't understand her in there and you know our words are joined together you know like his story broken up you know all changed around so we do need to look into our language uh, and understand what we are actually saying so i hope you enjoyed that one guys thank you for spending some time with me and i'll catch you on the next upload bye for now